too. So, again, welcome to the Kabbalists of Safed or the Kabbalists of Tzfat, a three-part series where, in which I hope to look at um, a little bit of history, a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of mysticism. Um, it's going to be a, a fun series, I expect. Um, there's a lot to talk about anytime you talk about Kabbalah. We've, had, we've actually had at least two mini-series uh, over the years on Kabbalah. We had an introductory series several years ago, uh, and then we had the Kabbalah of Mitzvot that we did a year or two ago. And if you take a look at the source sheet, which I circulated in advance via email, and there's a link in the chat for you to download it for anyone who didn't take it from the email. Um, at the top source, I gave you a link uh, to the collection where you can find our past introductory classes on Kabbalah. So anyone who wants more background, feel free to click the link in source number one on the sheet and you'll get more information because there's an awful lot to talk about, obviously. But I'm glad that you're all here to, to participate, those who are here just for this session or those who are here for the series as a whole. Um, I'm looking forward to the, uh, to the conversation. Um, for those who haven't been part of these classes before, I will note, um, I do record audio and video and upload them uh, after the class and I send out a link uh, with the, uh, well, I'll send out an email with a link to the various recordings so that those who aren't able to make it to the class are able still to, uh, to download it and follow afterwards, or those who were there in the class and just, you know, enjoyed it so much that they want to experience it again, I say go for it. Um, also feel free um, for questions and comments that we don't get to during the class, it's fine to email me afterwards and I will respond as I am able. Um, I wanna thank the following people who um, contributed to my Beit Midrash's uh, day of giving back in July and uh, their gifts are associated with this class. They're dedicating this class. So uh, Jason and Raquel Goldberg, uh, Noam and Talia Sampson and Shuli Diana. So thank you all for um, for your support, just letting more people in from the waiting room. And let's get moving, let's get going. Today we're gonna to be talking about Rabbi Yosef Karo. Before we get to him, we are gonna do a little bit of an introduction regarding Kabbalah. We are going to do a little bit of an introduction regarding the city of Tzfat, as well as regarding the 16th century. So there's gonna be a lot of background before we get to Rabbi Karo himself. But I wanted to show you why I picked him right off the bat, especially because some people may be very surprised to hear of Rabbi Caro as a mystic at all. Tell me something. I'll open the question to you. What is Rabbi Caro best known for in Judaism? Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch. He is the author of the Code of Jewish Law. Not the little abridged code of Jewish law you may have seen somewhere, the code of Jewish law. It is massive. He is the author of it. And when you think of somebody who would write a code of Jewish law, I would have assumed you think of somebody who's fairly straight laced. You know, you think of somebody maybe who, who you know, if we were to transplant him to, uh, to the 21st century and Western society, so he's got to have a tie. That's first of all. He's for sure got to have a tie. Um, he's, you know, the sort of person who has books and he probably has, you know, reading glasses. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's my stereotype that I have in my head. For someone who's going to write a code of Jewish law, probably has a wall full of books you know, multi, multi walls of books, of course, you know, whether he had them in spot is a good question, but that's sort of the image I would have for somebody with the encyclopedic knowledge that he displays, and we're going to talk more about his encyclopedic knowledge. I would not have expected the following from Rabbi Yosef Caro. Source number two is from a text that records conversations he had with a Magid. Now, you may be familiar with the word Magid in other contexts. The word Magid is a word that we use at the Seder, right? The big part of the Seder where we tell the story of getting out of Egypt, right? That's called Magid because it's when we tell. Lehagid is to tell. You may also be familiar with the communal position of the Magid. Notice how the pronunciation changes. It becomes much more Ashkenazi Yiddish, a Magid. What's a Magid? 
there's a Maggid Shear. Well, a Maggid Shear is somebody who presents a Shear, presents a lecture, right. but what's a Maggid? Somebody who tells stories. stories. A, public, a public preacher. Who's public preacher, itiner. right. Mark, itiner. you were going to say? Itinerant. Yeah, an itinerant preacher usually. A Maggid classically in Eastern Europe went from town to town to town with his stories and his parables, and, uh, and, and he would speak, and he'd you know, get supported, and then he'd go off to another town. That was a Maggid. Well, that's not what this Maggid is. Rabbi Yosef Karo's Maggid is an angel who comes to him with encouragement, with lessons, with instruction and rebuke, and not just any angel, mind you. There are angels and there are angels after all. This angel is the embodiment of the Mishnah. I say embodiment, even though embodiment doesn't make any sense when you're talking about an angel which isn't supposed to have a body. Nonetheless, it's an incarnation of the Mishnah. Mishnah, when you, like I see Susan scratching her head already, what are you talking about? Mishnah is the initial canonized text of the spoken Torah, meaning that the Jews receive the Torah at Sinai, but it comes along with a verbal explanation. That verbal explanation grows and develops and is communicated and transmitted across the generations until, hang on, Susan, until the beginning of the third century when Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi canonizes it as a text for multiple reasons, which we've discussed on other occasions. Persecution is ending the process of teacher-to-student communication as the Romans have issued a death sentence against anybody who ordains a rabbi, as well as the nearest community. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The Romans effectively put a stop to ordination. You are pre-printing press anyway, long, long, long before there's going to be a printing press. But nonetheless, there is a need to be able to publish texts that people can learn from. Prevent forgetting, prevent the loss of teachers. And so Rabbi Yudah Hanasi records an outline of Jewish law called the Mishnah. It's a text. And yet, the angelic embodiment of this text appears to Rabbi Caro. Take a look, please, at source number two, and you'll see what I mean. Then I'll take questions and comments. You should know, says the text. This is part of this work called Magid Meisharim, the one who speaks Meisharim. Meisharim is probably best rendered here as um, statements that are just, that are righteous, from the word yashar. So this it, Magid Meisharim text, much of it is recorded in the order of the weekly Torah portion. So this is on the first Torah portion of Breshit. And here it says the following. You should know that I am the Mishnah, which speaks through your mouth. In other words, you are speaking, Rabbi Caro, but it's my words. And when you will know all six orders of Mishnah, there are six sections to the Mishnah, appropriately, you will climb higher levels and the channels of the wisdom of truth will be opened for you. For I am the Mishnah and in me, sorry, I wrote too quickly there, in me is the wisdom of truth. I am the mother upon whom Proverbs says, whose mother rebuked him. This is a passage in chapter 31, as you see I wrote there. Right before the famous Ashes Chayel poem, it talks about a king whose mother rebukes him. So I am the mother. I am the Mishnah, the mother, the source that offers rebuke. I am going to guide you, Yosef Karo. Therefore, be careful from this day onward. Do not lose your thoughts from thoughts of Mishnah. Don't let your mind stray from learning Mishnah as you have done until now. And even though the matters of law which you are involved in, writing this code of Jewish law, are good, learning Mishnah will take you to higher levels. Grab onto this and do not leave your hand from that either. That's a quote from Kohelet, from Ecclesiastes. For both are good as one. So someone sent me a note, apparently he missed the, um, the posts in the chat with the source sheet, so I'm going to put the link one more time in the source sheet, but everyone, please, download it when you can from the emails. It works a lot better than yeah, downloading it during the class. 
Um, Rose writes in the chat that it's interesting that he, that the Mishnah here is identified as the mother and not the father. Um, I think there are numerous reasons for that, but Torah in general is worded in the feminine. The word Torah itself is feminine, as is the word Mishnah. So here we are told that Rabbi Caro is going to speak with the incarnation of the Mishnah, which promises him that when you learn Mishnah, you will become great. This is the same person who writes the code of Jewish law. There's a lot we need to unpack and understand here. Susan, you have been so patient. What's up? I want to know, is this, did he base it like the idea of the Kuzari? Because wasn't the Kuzari written by um, Rabbi Yehuda, Yehuda Halevi? Who, wrote, who did the Mishnah, so I was wondering if he oh. was influenced by the Kuzari. Right, so two different people. The Mishnah is Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi, beginning oh. of the third okay. century. Kuzari is Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi in the 11th century in Spain. So that would be after this? Um, before this. Rabbi, Rabbi Cairo is 16th century. All right, so yeah, be yeah. before this, but there was no connection because it seems to sound like the same concept. Right. So, so no, I mean, in, in only in the sense that there's, you know, a dialogue going on in the Kuzari, and here it's presented not really a dialogue. Rabbi Caro isn't speaking. It's this this being that is speaking through him as he writes down the the words. So, this this Magid is very odd. But what we're going to find out in the course of our discussion is number one, it's not as odd as you think. It's not as unusual, I should, it is as odd as you think, but it's not as unusual as you might think. And what in particular I want to get to is the remarkable fusion of Jewish law and mysticism expressed in Rabbi Caro's teachings. I'm going to show you a book that years ago I read and was very helpful for me. And since I'm on screen, I can actually show you. It's called Joseph Caro, Lawyer and Mystic, by Rabbi Tzvi Werbelovsky, Professor Tzvi Werbelovsky, Professor of Comparative Religion at Hebrew U, many years ago. This is the second edition, and that was 1976 or 77. Um, I gave it to you also on the sheet. You can see in source number three. The... Um, so we, we have a lot to talk about, but I credit that book with giving me my start in the, uh, in the topic. Someone sent me a message in the chat wanting to know how the Mishnah is related to Maimonides' Mishnah. So Maimonides actually wrote Mishnah Torah, which is a little bit different, although the words are linguistically connected, meaning the Mishnah literally comes from the word to learn, lishnot, to learn. However, it also has, so to speak, a secondary meaning in that the word shnayim, second, is connected potentially there. You review and you learn again, maybe. But Mishneh Torah is second Torah. And without going too far afield, what's the name in English slash Greek for the fifth book of the Chumash? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, which means... Oh, it's learning? Or is it learning book or something? No. no. Deuteronomy is oh, two. Oh, yeah, second, second saying. Second, Good. Second, second, right. Deuteronomos. Second law. Right? Deuteronomos. Deuteronomy. Second law. Because that book is called in Hebrew Mishneh Torah. Because so much of it is a, is a repetition and explanation of what came earlier in the Chumash. So Mishneh Torah is that term, and when Maimonides presents his code of law, which we're going to talk about, that is, in a sense, a retelling of Torah and law, so he uses the term Mishneh Torah. All of these are somewhat connected back to Mishnah, but I'm going to go further here. Um, and the answer to the question that Myrna asks, is there a connection between mother and Shekhinah concept? You bet. We may even get to a little bit of it. If not this week, then next week. Um, there is a connection to be made. Okay. So what we've introduced so far in the last 15 minutes is that Rabbi Caro is on the one hand author of the Code of Jewish Law. On the other hand, he's having conversations with, or he's hearing from, the embodiment of the Mishnah. Um, Mark, I see your hand. Um, is it something that can wait or? Okay, then I'm going to ask you to wait a little bit because I, I need to give a lot of introductory material here. So first of all, 
Kabbalah overall, we've talked about this before, the word means received tradition, a received tradition. Le Kabel, to receive. Originally, Kabbalah is taught teacher to student, sometimes in a small group, but otherwise it's just literally one-on-one -on -one teacher to student. Hence the origin of the term a Kabbal, right? A Kabbal, as it's used, referring to a small group of initiates. So the goal of this received tradition, and here I am radically, radically oversimplifying, but it'll do for our purposes, but the goal is to address the mysteries of the universe. As I like to make the analogy, most of Judaism, what we call the revealed Torah, is about what's going on in this world. It's like the, um, the what's going on in the room right now. Well, let me give you the full analogy. If you asked me how to create light in a room that is dark, my answer to you would be, there's a light switch on the wall, go over and flip the light switch. That turns on the light. That's the revealed Torah. That's halacha, Jewish law. What Kabbalah does is it says, yeah, but I wanna understand what's going on behind the walls. When you flip the switch, how does the light go on? Where is the electricity flowing from? Why does it flow? Why does it go this way and not that way? Kabbalah is trying to explain what's going on in the wires behind the walls. That's an oversimplification, but I think it's a good one. That's what this received tradition is, is, is offering, to understand more about God, about interacting with God, about what God wants from the universe, all of that. However, for much of the history of Jewish thought, Jewish knowledge, Kabbalah was not something that was publicly known, discussed, disseminated. It was something that was very private. We know it existed. That's very clear. So for example, there is a statement of the Mishnah, actually, volume is called Chagiga, in which going back to the Roman times, we are told that there is knowledge about the Merkava, the divine chariot, as is described in the book of Yechezkel of Ezekiel, but you're not allowed to teach it in public. You're only allowed to teach it teacher to student. So we're not gonna tell you what it is. So mysticism, we know, is old within Judaism, but we also know it was private. It only starts to become public somewhere between the 10th and 13th centuries, when books start to appear. Again, the tradition is much older, we know that. However, the books only start showing up then. A book called Sefer Yitzirah, the book of creation. Sefer Bahir, the Zohar, right? Perhaps the one that's best known. These works claim to be, to be recording a millennia old tradition. And through those books, schools of Kabbalah develop, recording ideas, which as I said, had not been in text form until then. So that there's one in Provence in Southern France, another one in Girona in Eastern Spain near the French border. And what's particularly interesting for what we're gonna talk about today is that the sages who are involved in that Kabbalah, in that mysticism, and I'm using them synonymously even though they're not, but for our purposes, they might as well be. The, um, the sages who are these mystics are also well grounded in traditional Torah, in Jewish law. An example, Ramban. Ramban, Rabbi Moses ben Nachman, wrote commentaries to the Talmud, wrote works of Jewish law, engaged in Jewish Christian disputation before James of Aragon. And it was also a very, very serious mystic. They did both. It wasn't like you know, this bifurcation in which you have the academics here in the library who are straight laced. And then over there you have the mystics. They were often the same person, which brings us to the 16th century but I'm gonna pause here because I know there are questions. So first of all, um, Mark, you've been waiting a very long time with your hand raised, yes. 
I was going to say, is there sort of a precedent with the Rambam himself in that he straddled both the, both the philosophical and the very factual worlds? Okay, so Mark worlds. asks a great question. Is there precedent for this in Maimonides, who on the one hand is a legalist, a codifier of law, and on the other hand is a philosopher? So that's a really fascinating question. In fact, there's been work done trying to argue that Maimonides was a mystic, even though much of his writing is anti-mysticism. There's a big difference between mysticism and philosophy. Philosophy is supposed to be based on logic. I can argue a point. And while, as I've quoted elsewhere, um, I think it's William James who says, the only thing philosophers can be counted on is to, is to disagree with other philosophers. So that, you know, for all the logic that all the philosophers bring to bear on the same data, somehow they all come to different conclusions. Nonetheless, it's all fundamentally about logic. Mysticism, and certainly Kabbalah, is about revelation. It's about a tradition. You're not supposed to be able to make up Kabbalah. Although it can be argued that there were Kabbalists who did so. And there's more to talk about in that regard when we talk about Rabbi Yitzhak Luria. But, the, the, um, but Kabbalah is supposed to be, by definition, a received tradition, which would be the opposite of what Maimonides is into, because he wants you to argue logically. He wants you to argue philosophically. He wants you to argue rationally. So there are those who make the argument that he had a mystical tradition, but the burden of proof is really on them because so much of what he says is the opposite. Dahlia, you were gonna say? No? Okay. So is this somewhat clear so far? I mean, we're talking Kabbalah, it's not supposed to be clear, but you know, coherent is maybe a better word. Okay. So this brings us to the 16th century. The 16th century is a terrible time for Jews. This is a time of flight from persecution you know, I, I had somebody in a class of mine back when I lived in Pennsylvania who, who talked about how Jewish history just seems to be one tragedy and one disaster after another. And that's actually what historian Salo Baron called the lacrimose theory of Jewish history, right? It's just tear filled. He was not into that idea and I'm not into that idea because the truth of the matter is that there were a lot of heights and there were tremendous accomplishments and there were thriving communities as well. It's not true that we went from one disaster to another, to another, to another, suffering the whole way through. The, um, but, but if you had to pick an era for suffering, you, you picked a good one with the 16th century. Um, this really, the suffering, you can trace back centuries before that, you had pogroms in Christian Europe going back to the time of the Black Plague in which Jewish communities were blamed for the plague. And you had massacres in scattered parts of Muslim lands depending on who was in charge at any given time. The Almohads we talked about a couple of years ago, they were certainly not our friends, but it's not just the Almohads, there were others. Um, then of course you have this, the, the Christian Inquisition and then you have the Spanish expulsion in 1492, the Portuguese expulsion in 1496, not to mention those who were there when we learned about Martin Luther, you had the Reformation and the hostility to Jews in, uh, in Christian Europe as a result of it. So the Catholics didn't like us, but the people who didn't like the Catholics didn't like us either, right? Disproving the idea that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, no, not necessarily, not when it's a Jew. The, um, it was really like, this is not a good time for Jews. We are fleeing from persecution in all parts of Europe, in North Africa. It's not a good scene. So the upheaval of communities at this time leads to a few things. First of all, deterioration of access to rabbis and teachers. Right? You, can't, you can't communicate, you can't get, get messages to, uh, to, to people to even, to even ask questions. So that even though at this stage in history, Jewish authority tends to be decentralized, you have rabbis in different communities and they're supposed to take care of their communities. It's not like you're writing away to a central authority somewhere. Nonetheless, communication between communities is decreased and the deterioration of access from community to community results in a weakening of 
traditional views and traditional institutions. That's number one. Number two, the utter failure of rationalism to explain people's suffering, right? Meaning in a normal time, one would expect, the, um, the, yeah, you sort of, you can look at the world in a rational way and say, God wants me to do X and so I do it. And even if there are things that I don't understand, basically the world is functioning in a way that I can accept and deal with and work with. When the greatest leaders you have and the greatest institutions you have prove just as vulnerable as everybody else to turmoil and to torture, they, um, you, know, you, just, you can't explain what's going on rationally. It's not working and people turn to other ideas to explain their suffering. This is also a time of a major growth in messianism. The belief that Mashiach is coming any day. Now, Jews are supposed to believe that always. We're always supposed to believe that Mashiach is coming any day. But this is a time when people are sure that it's right around the corner, in part because it's got to be. <laughs> like, how can things get any worse and how are we going to survive? but also because there were predictions made by leading figures that Mashiach was coming. Don Isaac of Barbanel, leader of the Jews in Spain before the expulsion, right, who actually managed single-handedly to delay the expulsion for years because of his influence in Spain, he predicted that Mashiach was coming in 1502 based on calculations that came from the book of Daniel. And then when he didn't come 1502, he realized, no, wait, I, I made a mistake. It's 1503 and then 1504. And, you know, at a certain point, you just stop because it's just year after year after year. But the, um, but the predictions are fascinating and the verses they're based on are fascinating. It's just beyond the scope of what we're going to get to. But the point is that you have these predictions of Mashiach, of the Messiah, and, of course, after the time that we are discussing in the 17th century, that brings us what? Sorry? Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi. Correct. The false messiah Shabtai Tzvi rides this wave of messianism. So this messianism becomes a very strong theme in the Kabbalah, the mysticism of the city of Tzfat. So this is just a little bit of background on the world we're dealing with. The, um, the Kabbalah of the time is fueled by the persecution the Jews are experiencing. But a little bit more geography and history is necessary. In the early 15th century, before you get to this era that we're talking about, where were the centers of Jewry? Go back to the beginning of the 1400s. Where were the centers of Jewish life? Susan, you're muted. Well, there was in Spain, but France, wasn't there also? So you had a center in Spain. France is not strong at that point anymore. But you had Jews in both Muslim Spain and Christian Spain in the early 15th century. Where else? Dahlia, you're muted. Poland. Poland, that's correct. Jews had fled from the pogroms that resulted from the Black Death and founded communities in Poland. They were helped by King Casimir in the, uh, in the 14th century, building on a couple of things that actually preceded him, but becoming much more open to accepting Jews there. So Poland has become, to be, has become a, uh, a major center. What about in Germany? Germany. Germany. So Germany is not at that stage. That's the place people are fleeing from pogroms at that point to go to Poland. How, how about Holland? Holland, not yet. No. Holland is a good question, Diane. Holland will become a major center for Jews after the expulsion from Spain. How about England? No, no. England does not allow Jews at that point. How about Tzvat? England kicked us out by then. So we're getting to Tzvat. The, um, that's exactly where we're going. But right now, in the early 15th century, not so much. The Moroccan Jewish community was actually strong in the early 15th century, although massacres would come to them shortly. And the, hang on one second. And the Ottoman Empire. 
the Ottoman Empire. The uh, Jews came there to flee from persecution. And of course, that's going to bring us to Tzvat. Rose, what were you going to say? Uh, wasn't um, Casuto, he was from Italy, but that was earlier. Was So Casuto was later, I think. Right, because uh, Casuto was 16th? We're talking early 15th right now. Uh, okay. Yeah. But yes, there is Jewish life in Italy. Italy was the, was the cradle from which Ashkenazi Judaism came when they moved from Italy to Germany. But yes, there is, um, there is Jewish life in Italy as well. It's a good point. So what's the deal in Sfat? Now let's talk Sfat. So on your sheet, if you see source number four, I gave you a map helping you to locate Sfat in Israel. It was a big, big pain trying to find a map that didn't insist on marking off the Golan Heights as something other than Israel. And I finally just <laughs> gave up. The, uh, and I just took this graphic from Wikimedia Commons. The, uh, you can see it's not even, you know, whatever. It is what it is. The, um, you just, I just want a map. I don't want your, your political statements. So you can see Tzvat is way up in northern Israel. That water blob there is what? Kinneret. The Kinneret, thank you. So the um, Tzvat is north of that, right? If you want to get cold in Israel, you want to have a good chance of seeing snow, that's where you want to be. So the, um, that's where Tzvat is. This is not for people who are making pilgrimages to Jerusalem. This is way north off the beaten path. It was actually known as the key to the Galil, Galil being northern Israel, in the Crusader era. The Crusaders took it over back in 1140 and built a fortress there. And then, of course, the Muslims came through under Saladin and remained there even after the Crusaders came back. The, um, that was a back and forth. But the Jews were kicked out by the Crusaders in 1140, came back with Saladin, and settle in that area. Muslims destroy the Crusader fortress in the year 1266, and again, Jews persist in staying there, and you have a small Jewish community um, that's there basically from, uh, from, from that point forward. You hit the 16th century, and Jews come to Tzfat in a big, big way. In general, as I said, they're coming to the Ottoman Empire anyway, fleeing expulsion, um, they, they, uh, and, and so you actually have Sparta community and you even have an Ashkenazi community there. Um, but there are at least three factors for why they want to come to Tzvat. Take a look at source number five where we get one from Professor Robolowski. He says, by the time Caro, that's Rabbi Yosef Caro, who we're going to be talking about. By the time Caro arrived, I'm going to keep saying Tzfat, even though I wrote Safed. I hope that's not confusing. I have a hard time saying Safed. Um, by the time Caro arrived in Tzfat, this insignificant Galilean village had developed to a flourishing Jewish center and was on the verge of becoming the Mecca of Jewish piety. There's a little irony there in, uh, in calling it the Mecca, especially with a capital M. The, uh, nonetheless, I hope the Saudis are okay with it. Scholars and saints from Salonika, Adrianople, and other centers of the Sparty diaspora were joined by pious men from Ashkenazi countries, Germany, Poland, Moravia, etc. So one reason for people to come to Tzvat is that people have already been coming to Tzvat. A nucleus already exists, and not just of people, but of leaders. Another reason to go to Tzvat is that there are holy sites in the area, and one particular grave which people still go to today. What's in that area? Anybody know? Dahlia, you're yeah. muted. The Arizal is there. and Well, the Ari wouldn't have been there yet. I know, but I'm saying there's that whole area where he was. Rashbi. Rashbi. Right. Rashbi. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Bar Yochai. Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is buried in Meron, which is right there. And people were going there even back then. So, um, sorry, what? I muted everybody, and I think I muted someone who was saying something. Tiberius? Isn't it? Right. Tiberius? Right, Maimonides' grave is there in Tiberius. This is also true. I don't think people quite went to his grave in the same way. Um, again, that goes back to his, his relationship to mysticism. 
But Rabbi Shira Bayochai is considered to be the founder of, uh, of mysticism in many ways. He is credited with the writing, if not the full Zohar, then a kernel of it. The, um, so that becomes a site for pilgrimage. And also the fact that it's off the beaten track. It's away from the urban areas. Mystics engage in what's called hitbodidut. They want to go off in seclusion, be on their own. The um, not necessarily enforced kind of social distancing that we're more familiar with, but like by choice. They will go off to be on their own and they're going to go up to a place like Tzfat. So those are, those are some of the factors that bring people there and in particular why mystics will, uh, will go there. You have a core group already. You have holy sites in the area and it's a great place on TripAdvisor when they want to know like number of places for mysticism to go. This is for mystics to go. Number one for mystics is definitely Tzfat. There's a lot to do in the area. So that brings us to Rabbi Yosef Karo, at last. It took me 35 minutes, but that's fine. So Rabbi Karo comes from a rabbinic family from Toledo, Spain. Um, his uncle, Rabbi Isaac Karo, had his own yeshiva, um, wrote a commentary to the Torah. His father, Ephraim, was also a scholar. Um, he, working backwards, we believe he was born in the year 1488. That's not going to be on the final. You don't have to write it down. The, uh, we believe he was born in the year 1488 based on the fact that he dies at the age of 87. And we know from a postscript on one of his published works that he died in 1575. So you work your way back and you do the math. He died at the age of 87 in the year 1575. So he was born in the year 1488. That's how we, uh, that's how we get that. His family leaves Spain due to persecution. Um, Rose writes in the chat, expulsion is 1492. He must have been very young. That is true. It's not his decision to leave Spain. The, um, his uncle moves his yeshiva to Portugal right before the expulsion from Spain. And then, of course, they have the expulsion from, from Portugal and he flees to, to Turkey. Not clear exactly who from the family went with that particular trip, but all of them have no choice but to get out of Spain. And Rabbi Yosef Karo ends up in Turkey. He spends some time in Constantinople. He spends some time in Salonika, both of which were centers of learning. Messianism in the Jewish community was very strong there. There was a false messiah by the name of Solomon Molcho, who uh, Rabbi Karo has some interaction with. He was in Egypt, it appears, in the year 1511. We know that because of a tangential issue. The, uh, there's a debate about the calculation of the sabbatical year, the Shemitah year. And there was a debate about the status of the year 1511, and he was in Egypt at that, uh, at that time. By the mid-1530s, so he's already somewhere in his mid-40s, he's on his way to Israel. He likely arrives in the year 1536. Now, if this were purely a history and biography discussion, I would get into the very interesting question of his wives. He's married at least three times, based on the writing in the Magid, actually. Um, it is unclear whether this was polygamous or sequential. We don't know. Keeping in mind that the Ashkenazi community has not engaged in polygamy for 500 years. You know, more than that by the time he shows up, but he's not from the Ashkenazi community. So it's not clear whether this would have been um, polygamy or not. The Ashkenazi community is done with it. I mean, polygamy was never widespread in the Jewish world, meaning you go back to the Talmud and you can't find a single sage who is polygamous. There's one discussion in the Talmud in the volume called Yoma about a, a sage who was traveling from one place to another and maybe he had another wife in the place he was going to. That's a whole discussion in its own right, but it wasn't a, a, a case of a man having multiple wives. It wasn't a popular thing to do for a variety of reasons. Um, but in any case, what I wanna focus on with Rabbi Caro is really his intellectual legacy. The, um, that's really where I want to, uh, where I want to focus. Um, I picked him for our series because he stands as a remarkable example of how, as we said at the beginning, Kabbalah and Jewish law could coincide in a single figure. 
that's the, um, that's the chief mystical idea that I want to focus on is this fusion of the two sides. So let's talk about him as a leader in terms of Jewish law. Right? Everybody with me still? Haven't, uh, okay, haven't, haven't you know, tried hard enough to lose you yet. The, um, if you take a look, by the way, at the end of the source sheet, you see my review questions? So we've covered the first two. Right? Why was the 16th century ripe for the growth of Kabbalah? And, the, uh, and our answers are the upheaval of traditional authority, the failure of rationalism to explain the world, and growth of Messianism. And then why did Jews come to Tzfat as opposed to other parts of the Ottoman Empire? So it would have been the fact that you had a nucleus there, you had holy sites there, and he to do it to the opportunity for for people to uh, to go off on their own and uh, and meditate. Okay, now let's talk about Rabbi Karo as an authority in Jewish law. When he arrives in Sfat, he is recognized immediately as the leading rabbinical authority in town. He is already very well known by this time. Even those who disagreed with his rulings nonetheless recognized him. At first, he seems to have been in charge of a very large community, and then there were political issues, and he ended up in, uh, in a smaller community. He set up his own yeshiva, his own academy. He had about 200 students who would go to his lectures, and he became involved as a communal leader as well. But he's best known, as Susan mentioned in the beginning, for Shulchan Aruch, but not just for Shulchan Aruch. He's actually known for three uh, major works of Jewish law, which require a bit of explanation. I'm going to discuss them in the order in which he published them, which may be a little confusing because they reflect different eras a little bit, but I'm going based on his, his writing. So the first text of his that becomes, so to speak, a major hit is called the Beit Yosef. So this requires a little bit of explanation. So we're going to do a little history of Judaism. We mentioned that the Mishnah is written down, this first outline of the spoken Torah, in the beginning of the third century common era. That's the Mishnah. Then the rabbis expand on that with a lot of discussion, legal discussion, discussion about all sorts of stuff that has nothing to do with law. And that becomes canonized in the sixth century as Gemara. Mishnah plus Gemara equals Talmud. So by the sixth century, that's done. Which means if I am a Jew living in the sixth, seventh century, what do I do if I have a question in Jewish law? I don't know what I'm supposed to do about something. Well, I could try reading up in the Talmud. It's really, really hard though to get any conclusions out of the Talmud. The Talmud is not always interested in providing clear answers. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say it's rarely interested in providing clear answers. It's not, it's not what it's for. Historically, rank and file Jews did not study Talmud. It's awfully hard to study. The goal of the Talmud was to present legal discussions. And if you are versed in it, if you're expert in it, you can arrive at law from there. So what did you do if you had a question? You wrote a letter to the Gaon. The Gaonim were the heads of the academies. There was one in Bat. well, there's, there, there are a couple in, in uh, the Baghdad area. You had in North Africa. You had one in Israel for a time. The, um, you, go, you, you send your letter away. Eventually, though, that stops being an adequate solution to the problem. The Gaonic system collapses over a period of about 200 years, such that by the time you get to the end of the 11th century, you can't write letters to the Gaon anymore. The Gaonic system is falling apart. And instead, you have a decentralized system in which communities have rabbis. But they also need resources, text resources. And what you start to see develop over a period of centuries is a literature of Jewish law. Compilations first take passages out of the Talmud and just take the passages that relate to law and say, okay, here is 
Here is what you need to know out of the Talmud. Instead of having to read the whole discussion, this is, this is your highlight. This is what you need to know. I could go through the names of some of them, but I don't want to confuse everybody with, with, with too much detail. The, um, but what you end up with is the first major standalone code of law that isn't just extracting passages from the Talmud, but is actually a standalone code of law is by Maimonides. And that is the text we referenced before called Mishneh Torah. It is a 14 volume work in which he codifies Jewish law. You wanna know the laws of Shabbat? Here's a section called the laws of Shabbat. You wanna know the laws of purity and impurity? Here are volumes that deal with that. You wanna know about marriage? Here it is sections of law in chapter and number. So in other words, you can look at chapter five, law number three, chapter five, law number four. It's much easier to use as a reference work. Okay, that's Maimonides. He does that in the 12th century. Maimonides dies in the year 1205. So he does that in the 12th century. Are we somewhat clear so far? I hope I'm not losing people. I'm monologuing a lot. That's not usually a good sign. The, um, but, but, oh, by the way, at the end, I'm going to need those who can stick around for, for a minute at the end. Um, I'd appreciate it, but I'll explain. The, um, but the, in any case, again, um, Maimonides does that in the 12th century, and that's well and good. There are certain weaknesses with Maimonides' code, and I'm going to come back to them a little bit later. But what I want to show you is what comes next. Susan, go ahead. I just want to ask you, because didn't he say that his, if you studied him, his code of, you didn't have to learn anything else and, there were, and people got angry about that? Yes, and we're going to come back to that. I'm just not there yet. You are correct, oh, though, Susan. Sorry. So Maimonides publishes his code of law, and that's all well and good. The problem is, though, one problem is that there are people who don't agree with him on various questions of Jewish law not like major, major big deal issues, so to speak, that are like, you know, throw his code out, but they disagree with him on points of law. Other sages, one is known as Rashba, Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Aderet. Another one is known as Rabbeinu Asher. He has his own views. There's Ramban, who I mentioned earlier, Nachmanides. There are disputes. So along comes Rabbeinu Yaakov, Baal Haturim, as he is called, and he puts together a different code of law called the Tour. You're talking now, I believe, end of the 13th century, beginning of the 14th century. No, it had to be well into the 14th century, actually, is when he does this. And the Tour arranges Jewish law in a different way. I don't want to you know, go into too much detail with this because I think I'll lose people for real. The, um, but he has a different way in which he structures his presentation. It's a whole new code of law. And what he does that's novel is instead of simply saying, here are my views, he says, on this issue, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and Rabbi so-and-so says that. He's trying to give you more of a range and then he says, and here's what I think we ought to do. But he's giving you more than just what Maimonides did, which was, here's what you do on X. Well, the first major work of law by Rabbi Caro is a commentary to that. Why did he write a commentary, this Beit Yosef commentary? Take a look on your sheet at source number six, please. This is from his introduction. I'm sorry, it's a commentary to the tour? Yes, to the tour. Okay, thank you. Take a look at source number six, where he writes in his introduction why he's doing this. He says, when a long period of, pa when a long period of time passed, we were poured from vessel to vessel, we traveled in exile, many pains bound together in sequence, rivals to each other befell us. He writes in very poetic Hebrew, which doesn't translate well into English, I apologize to the point that in our sins, the verse, the wisdom of its sages was lost, was fulfilled in us. We forgot so much, he says. We've been tossed around from place to place in our exile. We've suffered so much. People have not been able to study. They don't have communication. We've lost so much information. The hand of Torah and its students was lost for Torah was not made like two Torahs, but like infinite Torahs. 
because everyone has different ideas and different different uh, rulings. Because the many books explaining her statutes and laws. Note, by the way, again, Torah and the feminine, her statutes and laws. So he says, I decided to compose a book collecting all the practical laws with explanation of their roots and sources from the Talmud with all of the disputes of the legal authorities, none would be left out. He says, you know what I did? I reverse engineered the tour. The tour gave you, here's an issue, here are a couple of opinions, here's what we do. I wrote my Beit Yosef commentary that goes along with the tour to show you where he got it from. It's a legal history for these exiled Jews. Clear? But he's not done. Because then what he does is based on that, he writes what we mentioned earlier, the Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law. He says, I want to give you just a quick reference to Jewish law. Take a look at source number seven. He says, I saw in my heart that it would be good to collect the lilies, the sapphires of his words. His words, meaning the, uh, the, the tour that came before him. Excuse me, that would be T-U-R, tour? Yes, -O -R. Uh, it's written in Hebrew, but yeah. He yes, T-U-R is usually the way we write it. Yeah, you're right. The sapphires of his words, in a short form, in pure and all-inclusive language, attractive and pleasant, so the unblemished Torah of God would be fluent in the mouths of every Jew. And when they would ask a scholar a law, he would not be uncertain. He'd just look it up. I wanted a quick legal reference. Now, mind you, the code of Jewish law, the Shulchan Aruch, is monstrously long. Not, I mean, like seriously long. If I, if I were in a different space, I would actually show you the number of books we're talking about that, that it takes. The, um, but it, it's, yeah, it's giant. It's split up of four sections. Orachayim deals with daily law, the laws of Shabbat, the laws of prayer, the laws of the holidays, and that's got in and of itself more than 600 sections in it. Then you have Eben HaEzer, which deals with laws of marriage and divorce and a whole bunch of other laws that relate to that. And then you have Yoridea, which deals with the laws of keeping kosher and the laws of mikvah and the laws of a safer Torah and the laws of mourning and the laws of visiting the sick. And then you have Choshen Mishpat, which is all a financial law, courts and witnesses and testimony. And it's just, it's incredibly long. And look what he says in source number seven. My goal, he says, was all the laws will be clear. And he says, I divided it up into 30 parts that so you can learn part each day and in a month you can review the whole thing. It's awesome. The, um, but that's the way he thinks. And then when he's done with that, and I realize it's already 1055, but I want to get you through his intellectual part so we can you know, be ready to talk about his mysticism. Source number eight, he goes back to Maimonides' code of law. The one which, as Susan noted, Maimonides said, just learn this, you don't need anything else. When Maimonides published it, there was a storm in the Jewish world because he didn't give you his sources in the Talmud. There were people who wanted to burn his code of law because they said, what do you think he's doing? He's replacing the Talmud? They did burn it, didn't they? In they were, so this is a bigger discussion about what ended up happening. I, I don't want to go there right now. It's a good question. But take a look at source number eight. And Rabbi Caro says, you know what? I wrote the Kesef Mishnah. And the goal of the Kesef Mishnah, a commentary to Maimonides' Mishnah Torah work of law, is, as you see in source number eight, to give everybody an understanding of what his sources were. He says, I saw that Moshe, Moses Maimonides, the great luminary son of Maimon, Zichron of Racha, explained this Torah. Torah was commanded to us by Moshe and inheritance. He composed his great 14-part composition on all of the Torah's laws, its general principles, its specifics, its fine points. Who is like him? Maimonides was so great to teach in brief language and purity, like the language of the Mishnah. But then he says, generations who came after him were too limited to understand from his words and to descend to the depth of his pure statements, which were refined sevenfold. He was too good at what he did. And so no one could really understand how he got to where he got. The source of each law was also lost upon them. And he quotes your responsum of Rabbeinu Asher, writing in the 13th century, saying, all who give practical rulings from the words of our master, Moshe, son of Maimon, without being expert in Mishnah and Gemara to know the source of his words, will make mistakes, permitting the prohibited, prohibiting the permitted, 
all who read it think they understand it and they don't. So he says, you know what? I'm going to solve the problem. And he writes this text. He wasn't the only one. He wasn't even the first to try it. But he's the first comprehensive work, end to end pretty much, in Maimonides' code to reverse engineer and show you where all his sources came from. It's a bibliography. So Rabbi Yosef Karo, you can start to appreciate, is a giant of Jewish law. He devotes his life to trying to provide legal histories, bibliographies, a guide to Jewish law. He also wrote responsa that were published separately. I didn't even go into that. And if you want to know how strongly he was seen, well, all right, this is where we're going to have to start next time, but I'll tell you now. If you want to know how powerfully he was seen as a leader in Jewish law, you get to the ordination crisis of 1538. There were no ordained rabbis for 1,100 years. From the 5th century when the Romans got rid of ordination until the time of Rabbi Caro. There was an attempt in his day to ordain him. Not just him, there were a few with him. But that's what I want to pick up next time. He was seen as a giant. A giant unlike any other, really, in Jewish law. In this time of messianism, in this time of turmoil, he was a light for people. Go back for now to source number two, please. Because he's also somebody who's having a conversation with an angel representing the Mishnah. Which represents the Mishnah and says, I'm going to give you instruction. And what I want to do, which we're going to have to start with next time, is to understand how is it that somebody is on the one hand, lawyer, as Professor Robolowski calls him, lawyer par excellence, and at the same time, a very serious mystic. How do those blend? Why do they blend? And what does that teach us about Judaism? So what I want to do next time is pick up with this ordination controversy. Now, as I've done in other classes, I'm going to stick around for, for a while to answer questions and, and all of that. But also, I'm going to have one moment where I'm going to ask people to do me a favor um, after we stop the recording. But um, first, I'll take, I'll take a couple of questions first. It's 1059. So I'll take a couple of questions first, then pause for a moment for something, and then continue with questions. That's the way we'll work it. Those who have to go, please, you know, by all means, you committed an hour, you've given an hour. Yes, Rose. You have to unmute. No. Uh, so in other words, in summary, you're saying the Shulchan Aruch is a, a explanation and detailing of the Mishnah Torah. Is that in a simple way? So of, it's really more, it's, no, I, I spoke too quickly if that's what, what, I, what I said. The, um, the Shulchan Aruch is an attempt to provide a quick reference guide to Jewish law, okay. and it's based more on the tour then on the Mishnah Torah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I understand. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Um, okay. So I'm going to actually pause for a moment here, and and um, and I'm going to ask you to those who can stay for a minute, if I could have a favor, and I'll explain. So I'm just going to.